Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Alberto Diaz Calleros, and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American Studies here at Stanford. Uh, I welcome you all today to our uh, first lecture of the academic year, uh, which is entitled Ayotzinapa, Eight Years of Impunity, with author and journalist John Gilder. Uh, thank you, those of you who are joining us through our YouTube live stream. Uh, since this webinar is being live streamed, uh, a, I, I just want to remind people this is in our class uh, YouTube page. It will be available for uh, reviewing, rewatching once the live stream ends uh, with closed captions as well. Uh, kindly submit any questions you may have or comments into the YouTube chat, and we will make sure we uh, you know, try to address them during the Q&A uh, part of our talk. Um, before we begin, we usually start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we won't do a land acknowledgement of, of uh, the, where, where Stanford's uh, land is today. Uh, we actually want to just take a, a minute to acknowledge and remember uh, the tragic events of the day of September 27, the night of September 26, 27, 2014, already eight years ago. Uh, when 43 students uh, from the Ayotzinapa Rural Teachers College in Mexico were forcibly abducted by agents of the Mexican state and then disappeared uh, also with the complicity of the Mexican state in Iguala Guerrero, Mexico. Um, thank you, John Gibler, for joining us today for this anniversary of these tragic events. Uh, John Gibler is a much admired journalist. Uh, he's an author uh, of at least uh, several books in, translated in English, as well as books in Spanish, uh, Mexico Unconquered, Chronicles of Power and Revolt, uh, City Lights, uh, To Die in Mexico, Dispatches from Inside the Drug War, um, Home from the World, uh, which I, is the first book I read from you, uh, some, 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 some past, eh, is the title in Spanish, a guerrilla's escape from a secret prison in Mexico, and the latest book. Uh, I couldn't. I, I couldn't even imagine that they would kill us. Uh, an oral history of the attacks against the students of Ayotzinapa. Uh, so thank you so much for being here with us. And please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the Center for Latin American Studies. I'm very thrilled this is a um, Sara, Megan, and Molly, for all your work and presentation. Um, it's really good to be here sharing with you, although it's really hard to talk about what we're going to talk about. As I'm speaking right now, the families of 43 students and thousands of other people are marching in the city, in Mexico City. It's about eight years since uh, the night when uniformed police officers from three different municipalities, state police officers, federal police officers and members of the Mexican military, as well as ununiformed armed men, attacked five buses of Ayotzinapa students, um, killing three students and forcibly disappearing 43. One of the murdered students' bodies was mutilated. His face was surgically removed. His body was left on the edge of a trash dump two blocks away from one of the scenes of attack. They also attacked um, a bus of a youth soccer team, um, killing at that scene another three people, bus driver, 14-year-old soccer player, and a woman who was uh, a passenger in a taxi driving by. Um, that night, scores of people were wounded, six killed, and 43 disappeared. And eight years later, the families of the disappeared are still looking for their sons, and they're still looking for the full truth of what happened that night and what has been happening since. So that's why I'd like to, to talk a bit about with all of you. Um, as I mentioned, well, sorry, let me start back. So a lot of information to try and organize. Um, Ayutzinapa is a rural teacher's college in the um, southern state of Guerrero in Mexico. So, um, Third southernmost state in the country, for moving uh, west from the border of Guatemala. Um, probably most famous for the tourist port city of Acapulco, but in Mexico, well known as a state of combative uh, resistance to Spanish colonialism, 
um, and to later various versions of the Mexican state itself. Um, some recent history in the 1960s and 1970s, a number of um, guerrilla left-wing organizations, the Party of the Poor, um, led by Lucio Cabanas, um, uh, grew in, in Guerrero and had an impact nationally. Um, two of the most well-known social fighters, um, Lucio Cabanas and Genaro Vasquez, themselves were graduates of Ayutzinapa. It's kind of strange because I'm a native English speaker, but I'm translating from Spanish in my head to speak. So I'm starting to sound kind of clunky. I'm trying to like get back to what should be my native language. Um, uh, Ayotzinapa initially was a part of a movement of um, socialist inspired uh, teachers' colleges um, that would try to gear formation of young teachers for rural communities explicitly. Um, and it was a product of the Mexican Revolution, the attempt to tailor education for rural life. Um, many of the uh, schools include uh, indigenous language education, a lot of the rural areas, especially in Southern Mexico, but across the country are very large indigenous populations and a number of different indigenous languages spoken. Um, the schools very quickly took on a combative stance towards the Mexican state. Um, and there were multiple attempts to get rid of the schools. And as a result of that, student activism has become a double um, level of importance in these schools. Because they were not only fighting for the main social issues of the day, but they were fighting literally for their survival as rural college students. They were surviving to keep their, fighting constantly to keep their schools um, in operation, keep them open. Um, the schools are entirely free. They're for the students. They're subsidized by the, the federal government. Um, with some state subsidies as well in different states. There are currently 16 remaining um, North rural teachers colleges in the country. And um, Ayotzinapa, amongst those combative schools has a reputation of being one of the most combative. Um, they've held major protests uh, before September 2014 to try and increase the school budget to um, provide school transportation for the students. It turns out that students are required to travel across the state to observe classrooms, but they're not given any kind of public transportation um, and they're not given a budget to travel. So it's this conundrum because their curriculum mandates that they go and travel across the state, um, but there's no public transportation. Um, and that is how the kind of impromptu, informal, uh, and also very gutsy and combative solution that the students had devised for the last uh, several years, before 2014, was to commandeer buses. So they put up a roadblock on a rural highway or sometimes used where the existing uh, toll booths were already established um, and stop a bus, board it, and inform the bus driver that the bus was being occupied by the students, the rural teachers college by Yutsinapa for its educational purposes. They would usually let the bus drivers deliver the passengers to their final destinations. Um, and then the bus drivers would stay with the buses. Um, and sometimes they would camp out at the school for a couple of days, sometimes for a couple of weeks, sometimes even longer. Um, and it was a practice that was often begrudgingly but tolerated by all levels of the Mexican state. This had been going on for years and it had never provoked any kind of a mass operation, much less the kind of atrocity that took place um, in late September, 2014. Um, so this is a school with mostly um, students from rural areas, large, some significant portion of them in, indigenous, um, that when they enter the school, they quickly become kind of steeped in the combative social organizing traditions uh, of the student body. And in September of 2014, a large group of, well first, sorry, the political committee of the school had made a commitment during the National Assembly of 
rural teachers colleges all across the country um, to gather, occupy and gather a large number of buses so that all of the rural teachers college students from across the country could gather at Ayotzinapa and travel in a convoy of occupied commandeered buses to Mexico City so that they could attend a yearly protest on October 2nd, commemorating the 1968 October 2nd massacre of students in Mexico City. That is why in late September, they were trying to commandeer rather quickly a number of buses. They already had several. And on the night of September 26th, they left the school aboard two such commercial tourist buses or, 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 or you know, um, public transit buses um, of a company known as Gold Star, Estrella de Oro. Um, and they first went to the state capital, Chipancingo, to try and gather buses there. It's much closer, it's only 15 minutes away from the school. But there was a, a state riot police um, uh, operation in place. They knew the students were on there trying to get buses. And so they had all the riot cops at the bus station. The students get there, they see this. And with all of the kind of defamation campaigns against students in the state press in Guerrero, you would think they would just start fighting cops, right? Because that's all they want to do, they just want to fight. They put on their face coverings and fight. But no, they get there, they see the cops are already in place. They don't want to fight. They're like, they're like, they beat us, you know, we can't get them today. They turned around and they went back to school. Later that evening, they decided to go in the direction of Iguana. They left the school. Uh, around between five and six in the afternoon. Uh, most of the students on the two commandeer buses were first year students like yourselves, first year of their master's degree, this was the first year of their undergraduate degree. Um, they had just had their first day of classes like yourself. Turns out that September 26th for many of them was their first day of classes. They've been at the school already for several weeks. They've been doing orientation. They've been getting involved in the different clubs like the athletics club or the music club. Um, and, and they just had their first day of classes. Uh, they left the school. They drove about an hour towards the outskirts of Iguala. They split up. One bus went to the toll booth leading into Iguala. Another bus went around to a toll booth on the road to another nearby city in Mitsuko, called Mitsuko. And there they set up, they left to try and stop the buses. Something weird happened. It turned out the federal police show up at the Iguala toll booth stop. On the other side of the toll booth, they don't interact with the students, but they stop all the buses. They don't let any buses through. And so once again, the students are like, we can't get anything. You know, like they're not, they're like one step ahead. They're, they're you know, they've got our movements figured out and they're not letting us grab any buses. Meanwhile, at the other toll booth outside of Mituko, a bus was on its way into Iguala. Students stopped it. A commission of nine of them got on board, told the bus driver, you know, we're coming during the bus. The bus driver said, okay, but let me go drop my passengers off in uh, Iguala. The students said, okay, no violence. Um, I interviewed some of the students that were on that bus, that group of nine, and they told me that they were talking with the passengers on the bus that one told me a woman was really scared and saying, please don't hurt us. And he was explaining, we're not gonna hurt anybody. We're college students. This is what we have to do because we don't have public transportation. We're gathering buses to go to a protest to commemorate a student massacre in 1968. Don't worry. Like, and of course, you know, they were similar to self, t-shirts, jeans, tennis shoes, sandals. Um, they were not dressed uh, for combat. They were dressed for school. Um, they drove into Iguala. The passengers got off the bus. The bus driver quickly locked the students inside the bus. Um, those students freaked out, called their uh, compañeros out at the sill of the toll booth, trying to grab more buses, told them that they'd been shut inside and that the bus driver was like talking on the radio. They were worried they were calling the cops. Those students called the other compañeros at the toll booth right outside of Iguala, and they all just had to rush the bus station to free their classmates, their compañeros. So that's what happened, they both rush in. It's now about eight something at night. They bust the students out of the bus, and since they're at a bus station, they decide to grab more buses. 
and leave Iguala and go back to the school, which is an hour or something away. Um, so quickly, they grabbed two more buses of a company called Costa Line. And then at the very end, a third bus of that group, uh, Red Star. So now the students are aboard five commercial buses and they leave the bus station. They take two different routes. One group kind of heads out towards the center of the city. Another group has out in another exit at the bus station and starts driving around the city. Very quickly, the group of three buses uh, gets slowed down the busy center streets. And then within minutes, police officers start arriving, trying to shut off the buses shooting in the air. Um, I'll quickly try, I'll try quickly to describe what happens to these three buses. They block one of the buses with a police truck. Students get out, throw rocks at the police truck, um, force the police to put the truck in reverse and move and back out of the way. Meanwhile, they're shooting in the air. Some of the students are getting really scared. They say, you know, the students who have been at the school already, the members of the political committee who are there that night, say, don't worry, they're just shooting in the air. Um, they keep going. Meanwhile, more police officers start arriving. They start shooting directly at the buses. Some of the students um, that got off the bus to throw talks at the police car uh, were still on foot running alongside the buses. They start to realize that they're being shot at. They hear the bullets whistling by. They hear the impact of the bullets in, um, in glass and the buses. They run to try and get back on the different buses. Um, and they all slowly make their way completely across the city of Iguala, see so about 120,000 people, the dense kind of historic center, you know, just very big, narrow grid streets. They finally arrive at the, the edge of the center of Iguala, where there's a, a major avenue called the Periferico. Um, and right there, another police truck pulls in front of them. The police officers get out of the truck and run off, leaving the truck blocking the road. The first bus that pulls up, students get off, run up to the truck to push it away. In the confusion and the chaos, one of the students jumps up in the driver's seat to put the, the, the truck in neutral. Um, and unfortunately, students run to both sides of the truck to push. And at that moment, more police officers arrive, open fire. One of the students is shot in the head, falls to the street. The other students realize they're being you know, shot directly at. They see their compañero fall and they run for cover. At this point, a second bus had pulled up. Those students had gotten off the bus to try and help as well. When the gunfire, uh, uh, there's more gunfire from the just arrived police, they all run and either jump back on that first bus or because there, there forms a bottleneck there. Right? There was one student who a bullet went right through the flesh of his knee as he was waiting to try and jump on the bus at the, at the bottleneck. Luckily, he was uninjured. It, it didn't even touch his bone. Kind of a strange uh, miracle. Um, but, and the other students to avoid that bottleneck and get out of the line of fire ran and hid between the first two buses who had pulled up there. So, almost you have a group of about 20 students packed in to this space between two buses, which are you know, still running. Their tires have now been blown out, they've been hit with bullets. A third bus pulls up, but before that, a bunch of police cars had followed these two first buses, closed off the road, this third bus comes off. This is the bus where they shoot a student in the arm uh, as he tries to throw a fire extinguisher out of the bus to see if it might explode and create some kind of distraction that they could use to escape. All of these students are um, beaten, lie down on the ground, um, while these students are held in place by gunfire, the police are all over here. Um, one of the, the students shot in the arm, actually, uh, a police officer walks up, puts a gun to his head, says, you see the If I kill him? And then that same police officer pulls out a cell phone and calls an ambulance. An ambulance ends up arriving. They take that student, put him in the ambulance, and send him off to the hospital. All of the other students that were pulled off of this third bus on Juan de Alvarez were forcibly disappeared and haven't been seen again. Um, these students 
uh, were held there at gunfire. Then after all the police leave here, taking the 20 something students that are on this bus, um, these officers threaten this group of students, say, get out of town. If you don't, you'll wish you never come here. We'll come back for you. And they leave. The students decide not to leave because they think that uh, one of their colleagues has been shot in the head and killed. It turns out at some point, an, an ambulance after 30 something minutes comes and takes Aldo Gutierrez, who been shot in the head, also to the hospital. Another student has a, an asthmatic attack in a collapsed lung, falls to the ground. They kind of plead with the cops to let him also be taken to the hospital after back and forth. They allow students to come out, drop his body here, run in to take cover, or take cover again. They drag his body, throw him in the back of a pickup truck, take him a few blocks, and turn him over to an ambulance. These little details are very important because what it says to me, when this is happening, there was no plan to disappear the students. That doesn't make sense. Why would they be sending wounded students to a hospital if there's already a plan to disappear them? Um, so that's why I, I pause and, and mention some of these details because they have information that I think is really important. Um, the students decide to stay here. Another quick little observation is that, you know, for those of you who, who are, are new to this story or haven't done a lot of research into it, you don't know, but, but the students had um, for years undergone all kinds of smear campaigns in the press by the local government, by the state government, in Canada, saying they were vandals, you know, vandals and, and rabble rallers, rabble rousers and wannabe guerrillas and criminals. Um, and there was this image uh, of the Ayotzinapa students as, um, as like trouble, you know, mini criminal and so on. And this is really important for me in, in relation to that because when all of this violence just took place, so the students just saw one of their uh, classmates got shot in the head, another classmate's lung collapses, um, Another, there was a student shot through the knee, a student who was shot in the hand, one of his fingers was blown off, a student shot in the arm. They see all these students be driven away by the police and they're imaginary. They think that these students just got arrested, right? It's the police, the uniformed police officers. They put the students into the police trucks and they drive away with them. Their imaginary says they've been arrested. They're worried because they think they're probably gonna get beaten, might get tortured. Um, and so they decide in solidarity to stay put like we need to organize to help get our classmates out of jail right um and once it seems like the danger's passed the police have all left um teachers that are a member of the state teachers union stop sh start showing up in, in solidarity to help the wounded to make sure the students are okay and the students view this space as a crime scene i.e they view it in legal terms right they, as if they still believe the rule of law exists, that the state is there to prosecute crimes, right? That the state is there to protect its citizens. Their actions are those of people who believe in a rule of law, whose imaginary tells them a crime took place here. We were shot out unjustly, illegally by the police. I mean, yeah, you want to get, you know, very detailed. They grabbed a the bus from the bus station. That's a crime. They should be like, sentence or charge with that crime, right? Which isn't met with open gunfire. And again, this is something they've been doing for years. But they see it as a crime scene. Reporters start arriving and they say, hey, please be careful, don't step. This is evidence. This needs to be collected. This needs to be analyzed, right? They still believe that the state is gonna show up to do its job, which is to see bullet casings as evidence, which is to see a removed finger as evidence, which is to see blood-soaked shirts that were placed under Aldo's head before they were able to take him to the hospital as evidence. But this is a scene that needed to be analyzed and processed by the state in order to do justice. Um, that didn't happen. There's these other two buses, right? They drive completely around the city. They get separated. One of the buses, the fifth bus of the five, um, stops for a while because the bus driver says he needs to pick something up. Someone's going to bring in the package. The students are like, okay. Then they start hearing via cell phone because they're someplace else that the, their classmates are being shot at. Um, the fourth bus drives all the way around the city. It's on its way to the highway to get off 
and on its way to the state, towards the state capitol, back to the school, when it's stopped by the police, completely surrounded, and uh, police officers will bust the windows of that bus, shoot tear gas inside the bus, which is, they had no legal faculties. It turns out those police officers possess tear gas. Um, the students, when they were forced by the tear gas to leave the bus, were beaten, submitted, placed on the ground, and then driven off in police vehicles, and all forcibly disappeared. All the students on that coastal line bus, which was stopped right in front of the state courthouse, which possesses at least six CCTV cameras, which were all in operation that night, and several of which pointed directly at the scene of the uh, abduction of the students. You know, no force for forced disappearance. Um, those students are all disappeared, they haven't seen again. Um, the fifth bus is coming along this avenue, the Periferico, about to head out to the highway as well. When they see about 100 yards up ahead, the bus completely surrounded by police vehicles. So they stop. They tell the police officer, or sorry, the bus driver, try to turn around. We try to turn around. Let's get, let's find another way out of town. When a federal police vehicle, marked vehicle, a patrol, federal police patrol vehicle, pulls up, stops the bus driver, get, pulls the, you know, the bus driver and the students off, and at gunpoint is threatening the students. Those students, you know, there's some rocks in their hands. They're also threatening the cop. In the end, nobody throws a rock. Nobody fires a shot. Those 14 students turn around, start walking away, and then run. All 14 of those students survive. They spent the night hiding in different places, getting shot at at different points in the night, you know, trying to reunite with their classmates or different parts of the city, and then getting detected, seen, pursued, and escaping yet again. All 14 of those students survived most of them by, you know, after say two o'clock in the morning, were either hiding in someone's house, a woman who opened up her house and left them hide inside, and four who were the four fastest, they were up ahead before the woman opened her uh, house up, um, ran off and hid, spent the whole night in the hillside. Um, and this fifth bus is thus the only bus of the five that was not actually shot at. It was the only bus of the five that was stopped by federal police officers. That bus was escorted by federal police officers around where the other bus was being attacked, around the state courthouse, off to the highway, and sent up on its way. That bus arrived in, in Morelos. Bus driver wrote a note about what had just happened, turned it in before a, a, a local prosecutor, and went about his business. Um, at 11 or so at night, the bus filled with the youth soccer team, which had just won their game against the Iguala. They heard that there was a, there were shootouts in the city. So to protect the team, the trainers and the municipal sports officials decided to leave the city as fast as possible instead of going into the city to get there. The student or the soccer team had been promised tacos if they won. They won, they wanted their tacos, they were hungry. But the uh, trainers and administrators were scared hearing these reports of gunfire. So said, let's get out of town as fast as possible. We'll be in Chipancingo, the state capital. Um, they're about 15 minutes out of the city. They've been stopped at this major traffic conundrum, which is, of course, where a bus of students was being attacked. They end up getting around. They're 15 minutes out on the highway, but out of nowhere, gunfire rains in through the windshield and the side windows. Um, police officers have been uh, posted on, on either sides of the highway and just opened fire as soon as the bus came up. I interviewed several of the survivors from uh, that bus and they told me that the police, which they, they weren't able to identify as uniforms because they're inside this bus in the dark, you know, it's, it's, after, it's around midnight. Um, they're being shot at the terrified, but they heard the, in this case, armed men come around, and one of them say, "Ya la cagamos, comandante. Son populistas," which means, I guess I can do the full translation. We fucked up, commander. These are soccer players um, because they realized it wasn't a bus for my students. They all rush off. Um, federal police later arrive. 
don't help any of the wounded, don't use their police vehicles to move the wounded to the hospital. They were, one trader had six uh, bullet wounds to the abdomen. Um, a 14 year old student had been shot in the neck. They were very seriously wounded people there, but it wasn't until the family members of some of the soccer players were able to drive back and start taking people off to the hospital. And then finally, an ambulance had arrived and took more people out of the hospital. Around also that same time, back on Juan de Alvarez, where three buses um, had been stopped, one bus full of students uh, abducted, the two other buses of students protecting the area. Students at Ayotzinapa had heard that they were being attacked in Iguala and sent two like big vans of students to Iguala in solidarity to help. And those vans had arrived and were now on this location. They were giving a press conference, six reporters had arrived, cameras were rolling, audio recorders. They were finishing up the press conference when out of nowhere, machine gun fire. People from across this periferico avenue opened fire directly upon the students, the reporters, the press conference. Um, one student who unfortunately was right here, didn't know where the gunfire was coming from and tried to run across the street to hide behind the buses, was shot in the mouth. His entire maxillar bone and all of his teeth were removed in an instant. He didn't even know what had happened. He tripped, he fell, he saw some blood drops on the ground. It was like, I'm hit. Got up, run. All of a sudden, he's behind these buses. Another student sees him. He's got a very serious wound in his face, goes and grabs him and tries to help him. They all end up running from down the street, away from the avenue, away from the buses, and trying to hide wherever they can, inside houses, on roofs, jumping fences, taking corners. Um, and a large group of them hide in a small private hospital, which is just a few blocks down, the Clinica Cristina. Uh, Julio Cesar Mondragon Pontes, who was the student who was tortured, murdered, and whose face was removed, was last seen at this site, at this moment, running away from uh, the gunfire. He probably turned one of these corners and, and ended up running alone a block or so and was uh, abducted by the, the attackers. Um, by one in the morning, the military are on the scene. Uniformed soldiers are here. They go to the clinic. Um, they scold the students. They don't help the, the student with a, a gaping gun wound in his face. Um, they kick them out of the clinic because it's private property and they were you know, breaking the law by entering this private property. The door was open. There were nurses there when they ran in, even though the nurses didn't want to let them in. Um, but they begged and pleaded and they finally opened the door and ran in. Um, the, the nurses didn't help the wounded. They left. Um, the doctor called the police, but the military arrived. Um, the doctor wasn't there, but he got a call from the nurse on the cell phone. Um, the students are you know, scolded, threatened by the soldiers, and then sent out into the street. Um, one student and one teacher take Edgar, who had the bullet wound in the face, off the hospital. They had to lie to a taxi driver. So the taxi drivers had instructions not to pick up any students. Um, lied to the taxi driver, said they'd been in a bar fight, and somebody hit him in the face with a bottle. Um, finally, get him to the hospital. Over the course of the night, um, soldiers would go to the hospital and the police officers looking for wounded students. In several moments, nurses lied and said that they'd all been taken home, that their like colleagues had come or classmates had come for them, while there were several seriously wounded students still hidden in, in the emergency room. Um, and by the time the press corps from the state capitol, which were the reporters with the contracts with international wire, wire services like AP and Reuters and DPA, by the time they arrived, because of course they hear what's going on almost immediately, there was one student who called a reporter and was put on air live on the radio and she found single narrating that they were being attacked by the police and shot at, right? On the air live Friday night in the state capitol. So by the time the group of reporters arrived in Chipan Singo, won something, they've been stopped at red roadblocks, they've been interrogated, they've seen soldiers, they've seen police officers, the entire city is completely controlled by all these military and police roadblocks, 
by the time they finally get to the scene, the soldiers are there, um, and there are two uh, dead students in the street, um, and the military posing. So the images that would get sent off to the international press is of the bodies of these two students and the mass soldiers kind of in the shadows. Um, this is, believe it or not, an, an incredibly brief summary of a chaotic, complex a series of attacks that took place over the course of about seven hours. Multiple things happened. Um, so the different students were hiding in different locations. The 14 students who fled the fifth bus and tried to reunite with their, their classmates at several points um, all throughout the course of the night. Um, but this is the initial, uh, believe it or not, brief overview, which on my notes was going to be the first point. So that's already a little bit um, unfortunate. But so what happens immediately after the attacks in the days after is just chaos. I remember I saw, I was in Mexico City, I saw the newspaper that morning, and the headline said, it was an online headline, um, said 57 students forcibly disappeared and well as six people murdered, right? And I remember I just couldn't believe it. Literally, I couldn't register that as true. It's like, that can't be true. What is going on? They've got to be hiding somewhere. They've got to be okay. They've got to be like held somewhere. Maybe they were beaten so badly that the cops don't know what to do and they don't want to turn them over yet. It's like, this can't be that this incredibly large number of people, students when it's enough that have been forced to disappear. And in the days following, I kept waiting to read a kind of basic reconstruction of events, something like a version of what I just uh, shared with you all. I was like, what is going on? What has happened? But instead, what you saw was all these different numbers. The number quickly became 43, which is, you know, but it turns out that the students themselves were very confused because the four students who had been hiding in the woods, like it took them a long time to communicate. There were students who, when they fled the second uh, um, gun attack, for example, one student ran off to a bus station, was able to get on a bus and go back to his hometown. Another student got picked up by a taxi, somebody in solidarity who took him to where he had a family member nearby. And so there are a bunch of students who didn't return immediately to the school or gather in Iguala the next morning. Um, and so they didn't know where they are. They were, and it took a while, just a, a day or two to find the list of 43 students who uh, were missing, who couldn't be located. That first morning, the students, of course, all thought that their classmates were in jail. Um, and it took hours to figure out that no, they weren't. It, this, the students themselves didn't know that there had been a mass forced disappearance until like over the, the course of that following morning. Um, and so initially the news was just totally chaotic. And in the days following, there was no hard kind of journalistic reconstruction of the events, but also there was no official kind of just basic description of the events. The, the things that the government saying were, were saying were very strange. Like the governor came out and said, oh, it's, they're not disappeared, all of them, like the 57 initially. They're not disappeared, surely they're scared, they're hiding, they went home, which it turns out was the case for a handful of them. But the people in power already knew that that had happened. They already knew that the students had been, that we now know had been forcibly disappeared. But they lied, right? And so they say, no, certainly they're hiding. They're you know they're scared. We we're they're they're going to be found soon. Um, and then, in the, especially in the newspaper columns, in the op-ed pages, you started seeing all these speculations of. The students went to boycott a political event that the mayor's wife had held, and they didn't know that the mayor and his wife are narcos, right? And so go to boycott this event, and this is what happens, right? Um, or it turns out, like some of the op-eds would say, the students have been infiltrated by a rival narco group, and so that's why they were attacked. They later they would say they're confused with a rival narco group. Like, can you imagine a busload of Stanford athletics, you know? being confused driving to San Francisco for uh, some kind of gang, right? It's patently absurd. Um, they were having all of these kind of speculations coming out in the press. Meanwhile, the federal government was just like, oh, that's so terrible. This is a state issue, the state's gonna fix it. 
which is also like, why are they so quick to say this isn't really that important? It's a local thing. Like when there was so much effort to minimize, official effort to minimize what would happen, that was one of the first things that rang serious alarm bells for me is like, this is the beginning of a cover up, you know, of a, of, of a major cover up. Um, and then there was just chaos and confusion because of course the families are desperately looking everywhere. And this is the first people to look where the families were. The police have run to the government, they're running, they're going to Iguala, they're going all over the place trying to get information. Um, and meanwhile, they're faced with lies and they're beginning to hear the first kind of descriptions of what happened from the survivors and they're terrified justly because the story the survivors tell is the story of terror. And combine this with over the course of the morning of the 27th, as the everyone, the students themselves, the families are all learning that 43 students are gone, that they were driven off by uniformed police officers, the official police vehicles, and they were taken to jail, or there's there was confusion about that, but they're gone, they're not in jail anymore. Um, combine that with the impact of getting a message on your cell phone, opening up your message, looking at the screen, and you see someone whose face has been removed. One of the most horrifying images I've ever seen in my life. And I didn't, I, I read about it first, and I didn't even want to see it. I saw it because a colleague, a journalist was like, oh, you see the photo, right? You put it in my face, and I was like, I have to look at this, and then I'm going to try to never look at it again. Um, it was this impact of terror just survived this night, a bunch of wounded, six people killed, 43 students who don't know where they are, and then this image that is accompanied that of mutilation, terror. Um, so I decided, I was in Mexico City, my gut response on the morning of September 27th was to put a change of clothes and go backpacking, go to Chipotzingo, go to Ayotzinapa. But then a part of me, it was really critical. It was like, what are you doing? Like, you've got a ton of commitments right now. You've got something you need to turn in on Monday. Like, do you chase after massacres? Like, this is the like insidious kind of self-critical voice in my head that morning. Like, why are you going to go? You know, there are a number of people that are going to do this work. You don't have to like jump, you know? And I didn't. And to this day, I regret that. But that was what was in my head. And it wasn't until Six days later, it's at the march in Mexico City on October 2nd, which historically is an extremely combative march. And the anarchists always fight with the cops. And it's just this like, it, it's a huge march. The march, there were no police in sight. They had just uh, put up all kind of armored um, barriers in front of big hotels and, and city landmarks and some stores. And there were just no police in sight. And there was no one from Guerrero, obviously, because they were looking for 43 disappeared students. No representatives from the families, obviously, because they are desperately looking for their children in Guerrero. And initially on October 2nd, there wasn't a big presence of outrage about what happened either. There weren't people counting to 43, like what happened, you know, just weeks later. There weren't all kinds of poster boards with signs initially. And it was that absence that also made me think, what is happening? And if the states completely pulled back, it means they're scared. It means they're worried. There's something really, really big happening. And that was the moment I decided, I think I've got to go. Everyone, or like, I think it's really important for independent journalists to try and do some work around this because of the scale of what I thought I could already see of a cover-up operation um, in process. So I went to uh, the next day to see Francisco. I've worked in Guerrero off and on for many years. I know a lot of people, I have a lot of really good friends, local reporters. Met with them first. One of my dearest friends, Sergio Ocampo, had been in that group of reporters um, with his son Lenin, also a good friend, amazing photographer, um, who arrived in Iguala at one something in the morning. One of the first people from that group of reporters on the scene. He described everything that happened. It turns out their um, testimonies are incredibly important as well because they show from outside coming in how fully the city was under police, military, and state control completely controlled. Everyone going in and out of that city was stopping at these armed roadblocks. Um, and, and then the next day, uh, start went to the school and started interviewing students. I, I introduced myself to the students' political committee, asked for permission to carry out interviews with survivors at the school. They gave me permission. They introduced me to a couple of students that, that had been there that night. With my heart in a knot in my throat, 
I introduced myself and asked them permission to, to interview them. They said yes. We sat down on the grass and they told me the first versions of, of, of what had happened. Um, and they told me something that did not correspond to anything that the government was saying or to anything I was seeing in the newspapers. And really quickly, I think some of the local reporters hadn't done that yet because the events were so overwhelming and the daily news, the, the, almost the minute by minute news was so demanding that the local reporters were just trying to see what was happening then. And they didn't have time to ask about what had happened days before. And so I think that, I mean, of course they did ask a couple of questions. They wrote short stories, um, you know, articles that are only a few paragraphs long, um, but hadn't stopped to try and take hours to wait and like go step by step through um through the motions of the attacks so that's what i tried to do initially and in the first round of interviews in a single afternoon it's the fourth person i spoke to who described something completely different from the first three and had me totally confused because the first three described this scene of finding the evidence and so i was almost beginning to understand kind of what had happened there when i spoke to the student who's talking about being in a totally different part of the city and something totally different happened. Turns out he was on that fifth bus that was stopped by the federal police and then later escaped. And, you know, I had to interrupt him, which I hate doing. And, and be like, I'm really sorry, Compa, wait, I don't understand. Like, where were you? You described it and I was like, but the other bus is like, no, 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 that's totally different part of the city. We weren't there. And then when it finally hits me, I was like, wait a minute, this is way bigger than even we think. It isn't just a couple of buses on the street. They're attacking them at multiple locations. That's when I asked permission again from the political committee to try and have a meeting with all the survivors, introduce myself to them collectively, and, and start a project where I could interview all of them. And if possible, there are, there are a handful who didn't want to participate in the interviews, and I didn't interview them. But everyone who said yes, then I spent initially uh, two weeks um, interviewing them one by one at the school. I went and got a map. I couldn't find a city map, a printed city map anywhere in Iguala. So I went to a like, touristy hotel and pretended to be a tourist and they gave me their map with all the like local restaurants and stuff on it so that I could unfold a big map and with the students have them show me and walk me through all the like, where are the different exits of the bus station they went out? What are the different routes they took out of the bus station? Where did the different you know police officers arrive and open fire? Where were they stopped? Where's the, you know, the, how close to the courthouse were they stopped? go to the courthouse and see the cameras, all that. Started doing that reporting. Meanwhile, there's this kind of, a couple of things happened that, are, that were major. There's a series of mass graves that were uncovered and presented to the press uh, in early October, October, I think it was 4th. And I went later that afternoon with, with Sergio and other reporters, a state police officer who was since been murdered and was in charge of that scene that day told me, um, 17 of these bodies belong to the students. The others are already at home. What do you mean they're at home? I just came from the school. There's a press conference with the families. They're disappeared. He's like, no, 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 look, there's no signal here. As soon as you get back into town, you'll see, yes, that is with You know, they're already back home, just lying through his seat. Um, and those remains of 29 uh, bodies removed from the mass graves outside of Iguala that day were analyzed. There was, there was a lot of genetic material there that would be analyzed rather quickly. And none of the DNA of those 29 bodies matched any of the students. And that was when a bunch of residents in the city of Iguala realized, oh, our family members that are missing, our family members that were disappeared, our family members that got pulled out of their cars at the police roadblocks, that got picked up in bars, that's where they are, they're underground. So they started meeting at a church in Iguala and created what would become known as Los Otros Desaparecidos, but the other disappeared um, and began what would become, or, or was a, an important moment in a movement that would span the entire nation of family members of the disappeared, looking for clandestine graves, finding them, and then using political mobilization to pressure the state, because if they remove the remains themselves, then all of a sudden they're committing a crime, right? So they would locate them, confirm there are human remains in this location. The way they would do it is by getting these long iron rods, hammering them into the ground, pulling them out and smelling the tip. It smells rotten with human remains. 
Um, and with that technology, they were finding scores and scores and then hundreds of mass graves outside of Iguana, across Guerrero, and in states across the nation. Um, and organizing then uh, a devastating but incredibly powerful and important movement, social movement of the family members that disappeared and the uh, localization of Fosas Grandesinas, Fendesan Graves, and then the pressuring of the state to actually recover the remains and carry out all the proper um, forensic analysis necessary to identify them and to get in touch with the families. Um, that also happened in those days. And then in late October, the federal attorney general, now a very infamous figure, Jesus Murillo Karam, appears on television with another infamous figure now, uh, fugitive in Israel, Tomás de Don Lucio, and they give an initial version of the students were abducted by the police, they were turned over to a drug cartel, and then they were taken out to this trash dump, and they were incinerated. Now, that first brief summary that they set out to the press, this wasn't later, it's a week or so later, they'll, they'll talk about the Verdad Historica on November 7th. But that first initial kind of version, which they had already tried to leak out to the press in several different insidious ways, including a woman came up to me at an event in mid-October to say there was a student survivor and she could take me to him. And I was completely terrified, right? Um, but because if there was just one survivor, that meant that the other 42 didn't survive. Um, and at that moment, there was still very real hope that these students were not forcibly disappeared, that they would reappear at any moment. Um, and, and I won't tell the whole long story, but it turns out that person had tried to like, kind of leak me this version to get me all excited. I had the exclusive about what really happened and I would publish it. But I told her, I can't publish anything until I speak to the person who lived through it. So if there's a student survivor, I have, I have to talk to the student. And then she was like, oh, that can happen, that can happen. And I was like, okay, it'll happen. I'll meet you at this bus station at this time. I went to the major security blunder on my part, alone without telling anybody, show up. And of course, she doesn't show up. I call on the cell phone. The cell phone doesn't pick up. Long story. But that, it turns out later, talking with a number of other independent reporters, um, versions of that had happened to different reporters who didn't fall for it and, and publish on truths that they couldn't uh, document. Um, and that was all happening in those days of late October. And then, of course, on November 7th, there's the infamous press conference where Tomas de Lucio and Jesus Murillo Caram present these narcos who uh, confess to this horrid brutality of incinerating the students, all of them, 43 human bodies, at the Copula trash dump from like midnight until like three or four in the afternoon the following day. Immediately, that didn't make sense. First off, for me, when they emphasized that the police turned over the students to the drug cartels, that was what it was like. If you do work in these regions, you know that the police are a part of the drug cartel structure. So there's no turning over. But the police that apprehended them, if they have already submitted these combative students, they have them under the, their control, they're going to take them to the place where they're going to do whatever they're going to do, whether, whether it's like, detain them, incarcerate them, or other things. Um, this idea they would turn them over to this much smaller group of lesser armed, lesser trained individuals that don't have the proper vehicles, stack them all into these, you know, trucks used to move farm products. It didn't make any sense. And it seemed like an ideological move for me to start getting, preparing the idea that it was narco, right? You know, moving the focus away from state agents towards non-state actors, drug cartels, and so on. And then the fact they incinerated 43 human bodies in a single night when we already knew that that night it rained. It's literally just that simple. Does it make sense to you? Because we're not talking about burning a body. You could throw gasoline on the body and set it on fire in a rainstorm. They don't go out, they throw lag gasoline on, and try and set it on fire again. But we're talking about incineration. So the extent to where, according to the government's theory, there was only one fragment of a bone about this big that had enough DNA material to be analyzed in the world's most high-tech DNA uh, um, laboratory in Innsbruck, Austria. That's not just any old fire being fed with you know, tires and, and wood during a rainstorm. 
it simply didn't make sense. Um, and so, you know, from the very beginning, a number of, of independent reporters, as well as the families, the families were the first ones, by the way, as soon as they put out that first version that they were um, uh, burned at the trash dump, the families themselves got together a commission, they went to the trash dump, they looked at it and they were like, there hasn't been a huge fire here. Look at all this green. Not only are there bushes all around the trash dump that would have been consumed in any kind of a major fire, but there were weeds. There were little green weeds all over the floor of the trash dump, like that wouldn't have survived, you know, a major funeral pyre. So even with, you know, this isn't science, right? People, these are farm people, these are people who work the land, but with their knowledge of the land, they were the first ones who showed up, analyzed, researched, and said, no, this doesn't make sense. Right. Now we have, you know, eight years later, we have exhaustive fire expert analyses. We have the Argentine anthropologic or and forensic anthropology team that did a years long, literally square inch by square inch combing and analysis of the floor of that trash dump, produced a multiple hundred page report to tell us that fire did not take place at that location on that night. Right. Um, but this was. We have to make sure we have time for questions. All right, yeah. We have to fast forward. <laughs> All right, we're on point four of like 20. Sorry, we did it again. I thought I would I learned and I didn't. Thank you very much. Um, and okay, so let's just jump straight into the cover up, which I think really we're talking about the administrative stage of forced disappearance. There's the material stage of forced disappearance, which is when the police officers submit the students and drive away with them to an undisclosed location. And then there's this administrative stage, which is when the army, the Marines, the federal police, the federal attorney general's office all jump into gear to make it impossible to find the students, to lie about what happened, to protect the people who were involved. And they do all manner of arresting people that have some people that were involved and other people that had nothing to do with the events, torturing them all to produce a false, a series of false confessions, false narrative connected to a false crime scene. Um, the anon supposed anonymous call that tipped the authorities off to the first four individuals who were detained who would be used in this press conference to construct La Verdad Historica, that phone call itself never happened. It's now known, there's even an eyewitness testimony said, actually, I was the one who wrote the false document days after the people had already been detained. The entire thing was a montaje. The entire thing was a show. And it was put together by the entire structure of the Mexican state. We're talking, oh, I said the entire structure of the administrative branch of the, of the Mexican state. It's the presidency, it's the interior ministry, it's the federal police, it's the secretary of defense, it's the secretary of the Marines, um, Secretaria de la Marina, eh, all collaborating in the initial operations to detain these people, multiple, multiple of them in the torture sessions. Jumping forward, we now know there are 60 videos that the perpetrators themselves filmed of the torture of 50 individuals. Whether or not the detained were tortured is no longer a question, right? It was videotaped by the torturers themselves, as well as all the documentation of their wounds. The military themselves documented the wounds with the logic that they were drunk and they fell. And yet they fell when they were being detained, but their wounds augmented over the course five days after being detained. Um, they construct this entire Verdadistorica, which is the lie, which is the administrative stage of forced disappearance. And they just defend it for the four years they were still in God. They just lied through their teeth openly, didn't care in international forums to the press every time they opened their mouths. And in fact, Jesus Murillo Caram, who is right now in jail, still lies. He still says, he still says, there has not been a shred of evidence to counter the case file I put together, which is just simply a lie. There's three independent expert reports. There's the entire forensic anthropology report. There's the United Nations Special Report on Torture. There's all the investigative work that journalists have done, the interviews with the survivors, all the work the families themselves have done, there's just this insane amount of actual documented evidence to show that the Kokula trash dump scene was an invention. A new government was, was elected in 2018, and 
during Andres Manuel López Obrador's campaigning, he campaigned in Iguala, and the families organized and occupied the stage. They didn't ask permission. Walked up on stage, occupied the stage. López Obrador was like, you know, let him have it. Like, don't try and, and fight. Gave him the microphone. The students demanded that the new president take seriously uh, what had happened and, and actually investigate it. And the president made a commitment to do so. And then he repeated that commitment throughout the campaign. And then when he was elected as president, he elect, he very explicitly repeated that commitment. It's important for many reasons. One, that was the only commitment to investigate a major, to use this language, human rights atrocity that had taken place in, in the prior administrations or in the context of the prior two administrations, what was called the drug war. Um, there were tens of thousands of forced disappearances. There have been scores and scores of massacres. There have been, like, at that point, more than 100,000 murders related to these policies. And Andres Manuel López Obrador explicitly committed to investigate one. So that had an importance for what it's what it is, of course, it also had a symbolic importance for a country that had been traumatized by over a decade of violence um, that the prior administrations had not only in many cases directly caused um, and in all cases completely minimized and tried to depoliticize. So he, Lopez Obrador, set up a truth commission. Also, once he was uh, in office, set up a special uh, prosecutor's uh, office for that Yitzhak case inside the federal attorney general's office. So you have a truth commission and a special prosecutor. He, uh, they invited the independent group of experts known as the to come back to the country. They've been kicked out in 2016 by the Peña Nieto administration to collaborate in the investigations. And over the past four years, there have been these multiple parallel investigations taking place to state and one kind of in conjunction with the state and the families, their representatives in the Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights. And only just recently, like literally in the past months, there's been an incredible flurry of activity. Um, it's very complex, it's very confusing, and sadly, I think it's incredibly disturbing. Um, first, we'll start with the October, I'm oh, sorry, August 18th um, presentation of the Truth Commission's report which um, clearly states that the Ayotzinapa killings and mass forced disappearance was a crime of state. They say that this is the first time the state is actually investigating and prosecuting a crime of state um, of a previous administration. Um, they completely, which they've done in talks before, but they, again, they completely certified that the Verdad Historica there trash dump in Kokula version, it's completely false, a complete fabrication. Um, and they purport to have new information uh, describing what actually happened, who made the decisions, and, and where the students had been taken. Um, that report had only been shared with the families hours before. The previous government wouldn't even talk to the families before they would hold these press conferences and say things. Right? They would just say it in the press, the families would learn about it on media and be traumatized. Here, they talk to the families hours before. Um, and they put out a report, it's 97 pages long, it has all these annexes as well. The report is 97 pages long, big font. 38 pages are redacted, completely blacked out. Um, and most of the report appears to be screen captures of WhatsApp messages, the identities of the people communicating all redacted, as well as the content of the messages. Sometimes you see times and dates. Um, and it turns out that, you know, initially we're like, what's going on here? Like this report seems really thin. It seems kind of shabby for four years of work. And then the only thing you're really showing, you're also not showing it. You're saying we have this, but we're not telling you what it is. And also you met with the families or hours before. And another detail, it turns out, that the special prosecutor for the case, who himself before was the technical secretary of the HIA, independent expert group, so someone the families really trust, he wasn't there at that public presentation because he was in Israel. He had gone on official uh, diplomatic business to try and negotiate the extradition of Tomas de Lucio to face justice 
in Mexico. Um, so initially, my response to this report is this is really strange. Um, and then the next day, August 19th, they arrest Murillo Cano. And then it's a big publicity thing. It's former attorney general being arrested. And then days later, we learn that at the first public hearing for, uh, before a judge, none of the special prosecutor's office was there, which is really confusing and very strange. They're supposedly the people putting together this case. Why aren't they there? And my cynicism and, and, and life experience, which leads me to not trust uh, the state, <laughs> um, say it clearly, um, said, okay, something's going on here, something they're trying to cover. Why do you put, why do you arrest this guy when the lead prosecutor's out of the country? Why is his team not part of the first public appearance before a judge, an appearance during which the judge constantly is scolding the lawyers because they don't know what they're doing, right? And because the information that they're getting is so chaotic and confused and doesn't hold water. So like, this seems like it's last minute. The report itself seems like it's kind of last minute. The central information in the report hasn't been shared with the independent experts, the TA, or with the families. So it just leads me to doubt, what are they trying to do? Um, and, and I got worried that they were going to try to blame things on some low-level military uh, officers in, in Iguala and the former administrative or the former administration's officials, like the former attorney general. So it kind of make it political, like, yes, we really investigate state crimes now, but not go to the highest levels. And everything that we've documented that we've seen is that it was the full institutions participating at every level that night and in the subsequent months and years in the lies and the torture and the fabrications, right? It wasn't random individuals, it was the full structure of the institution. And so Lopez Obrador has constructed a presidency, a presidency extremely linked to the army. Um, he has granted the Mexican military more power than any president in recent history or in history. Some he created a new national guard and then later put that national guard under the Secretary of National Defense, right? It's called the Army. He has just announced that he is giving internet construction contracts directly to the Army. So the Army is going to be building and administering internet availability for people in rural areas. He gave the construction and administrative contracts for major infrastructure projects like the New Mexico City Airport and this, you know, very controversial Mayan train in the Yucatan Peninsula directly to the armed forces. Um, and so I start to ask myself, is there a move here to protect the image of the institution, to protect the highest levels of the former Secretary of Defense? You know, some of you recall that the individual who Secretary of Defense when the students were attacked in, in the years after was the General Salvador Cienfuegos. Salvador Cienfuegos was arrested in the United States of America when he was visiting Los Angeles um, and detained and charged with drug trafficking, right? Um, Lopez Obrador forced the United States government to withdraw the charges, to return the general to Mexico, where he very quickly sent him home. He didn't set foot in a Mexican jail. Not only that, but humiliated the DEA by publishing the entire case, uh, the file, the, the charges against him online, saying, "Look through this. There's nothing. This is this is this is a, an empty allegation." So you have a history. This history of the Mexican president standing up to the United States, forcing the United States to unarrest a general charged with drug trafficking, sending him back to the country, and then Lopez Obrador uh, sending him home. Curiously, the general. Who was in power during this entire time and who constantly repeated to the press that his soldiers were untouchable, that no human rights lawyers were ever going to talk to them because they wouldn't be treated like they were criminals. The independent investigators insisted and requested and requested and requested to be able to talk with, not to arrest them, to be able to talk with the soldiers that were in active duty in Iguala that night, the two different military bases located in the city. And they were denied those requests consistently. They've never been able to interview those soldiers directly. They were never given access to the full military files. They were only begrudgingly in 2020 granted access to some 
marine files and I'll, I'll, I know I've gone way over so I'll try to hit in a little bit with this just to give you guys an idea one of the things that the HIE found in 2020 the fall of 2020 um after you know the worst kind of um months of the pandemic um and starting to get back to work in uh marine files they found drone footage from October 27th from six in the morning until about 8 30 in the morning October 27th 2014 marine drones which is flown out of Mexico City um hovering over the Cocula trash dump two days before the federal attorney general supposedly went there and found everything um you see the Marines pull up, you see them unload bags from their trucks, you see them start a fire, later put the fire out, you see them go down into the base of the trash dump and spread stuff around, you see them kicking stuff, you see them go up and down and up and down, you see federal police come up and then hang back, you see the federal attorney general's office, including the federal attorney general himself, Jesus Murillo Karam, drive up in a convoy of six vehicles, get out, go talk to the Marines. You see them all pull way back. A Marine helicopter flies in, lowers itself into the trash dump. What does that do? Spreads everything, all the shit. And then pulls off and flies out. Two days before the official first appearance in the case file of the Kokuna trash dump as the location where the students had been forcibly disappeared incinerated over the course of the night. So, sorry, that was a bit chaotic. Um, and I'm sorry for people listening or online and in the future, um, but hopefully we can also do some question and answer and get in some more. Next, next, I mean, this is very important that you can reconstruct and you can tell us a lot of the details that many of us who have even followed Try to read all the reports from the AA and and you know you bring so much to the table. Uh, so I do want to make sure we have time for a couple of questions and we will probably continue conversation. Uh, you want to? Yeah, well, just quick, I have to run for getting a vaccine booster, but I really didn't want to miss your talk. Thanks, Jan. This is incredible. This is like amazing. I really, really thank you for all the work you've done. I don't know if you're going to be around if you're at Stanford now, but that would love to meet like a chat. So if anyone has a question on the YouTube channel, please send it and I will make sure I read it, but uh, please. You mentioned um, the president using the army and the military almost like a labor force, right? And so just what, what main vulnerabilities do you see when we look at state and institutions and a president having a military at its disposal? What are the your main concerns? Well, first, I mean, the, the history of the Mexican military being used as an oppressive force against its own population, right? The, the, it uses as a counterinsurgency force, um, both when there were active insurgencies, you know, insurgent movement, um, as well as during all kinds of non unarmed, nonviolent protest movements. Um, uh, so that's, I think, one of the main concerns of, uh, you know, broad sectors of Mexican society. There was, there was a huge movement, for example, in the in the mid nineteen nineties after the Zapatista uprising in in you know January first, nineteen ninety four, and when very quickly the uprising moved into a process of negotiations um, between the Zapatistas and indigenous representatives from across the country and the Mexican state. Um, in those months and the years afterwards, the huge movement to talk about, you know, opposing the militarization of the country and opposing the military to be used as an oppressive force against its own population and not a military to defend the nation against a foreign invasion, but a military that's used to squash protest movements and to oppress indigenous defense of autonomy and territorial rights. Um, and so that's huge. One thing, okay. One of the ma many major gaps in my presentation is to, to talk about what was going on in Iguala. Students, uh, what did they step into? What could possibly provoke the Mexican state to go through all of this effort, to expend all of these resources to not know what really happened? 
what's this idea that the students probably commandeered a bus that had been retrofitted with hidden compartments with a heroin? There have been a number of cases, both uh, investigated by the Mexican authorities as well as by the DEA, to show that buses, passenger buses, have been used to move heroin from Guerrero. Guerrero is one of the largest heroin producing regions in the world. It's the largest region inside of Mexico, one of the largest regions in the world. 2014, remember what was going on in the United States, right? This was a heroin boom, right? This is when they were starting to crack down on Oxycontin and all of the opioid pills, and there was a boom in the market for actual heroin because there are so many people who have become addicted to the pills that couldn't get them. That boom is already bust, and fentanyl came in and completely trashed this market. But in 2014, the export of heroin from Mexico to the United States was worth untold billions of dollars. And that's where they stepped in and they grabbed that bus. This is what it seems like, right? I don't, I want to say it's a conclusive improvement, but this is the leading hypothesis. If that is really the case, what does that tell us about the involvement of the Mexican state in the heroin industry? Is they're running it. If they grab a bus retrofitted with the heroin shipment, who was called to stop the bus? The cops. And then who was called to just, like completely control the city and make sure like everything is under absolute control? The military. And then who was called in to protect all this and cover it up? The Marines, the military, the federal police, the federal attorney general. It's literally the Mexican state hiding the fact that it openly participates in transnational drug trafficking and that in order to protect the revealing of that participation, it's willing to kill, to mutilate, to forcibly disappear. Meanwhile, by the way, the United States government, they know all of this. They've got all those phones tapped. They're watching. Obama receives Peña Nieto in November of 2014 at the White House, right? Every administration has been completely in collaboration with this so-called drug war. In fact, the drug war itself, everybody knows, is a U.S. invention. It's a U.S. product that's been forced on countries, first on its own population in intensely racialized violence in the United States, largely targeting, targeting Black communities, and then Black communities and communities of color, designed in the 1960s and 1970s, in a context of you know, Cold War counterinsurgency foisted upon countries across Latin America, used as a pretext as well to disguise all kinds of uh, political violence and counterinsurgency operations. And they've been letting it go, I think, because it's just really good business. It's become just this huge industry. The drug war itself is a really big business. All of the arms deals, all of the budgets, and the fact that it can be used to disguise all manner of political violence. And I think they were so arrogant, the Mexican authorities, with Ayotzinapa, because they've been getting away with it. And they thought, we're just going to be able to say, fueron los narcos. Y tarde o temprano va a ser un ni un ratito. You know, but then everybody's just going to get used to it. Um, and it'll work. And that's why they just doubled down and just lie. you know. So that's what I think is going on. So you not only have, you know, an armed forces with a history of being used to repress its own population, but an armed forces that administers the transnational heroin trade. You know, participates directly in it and then administers it and is willing to commit, you know, unthinkable atrocities to protect that trade. So there's a question from the YouTube listeners from Melinda Gandara, which is a little bit in a different realm. Um, she says, Thank you for your excellent presentation. Are you aware of Ana Teresa Fernandez's piece where she paints her body black? And can you tell us a little bit about responses that you might be aware of in the more in the artistic world, in, in the creative? Oh, thank you for that question. I'm not aware of that piece, um, yeah, that right. but uh, there's been an it's like an incredible explosion of acts of artistic solidarity with um, with Ayotzinapa and with, with a number of course, social movements. It's not unique to Ayotzinapa. With Ayotzinapa, maybe because of the age and because of the kind of digital technologies were, that were around, the number and the speed with which that artistic solidarity um, was expressed was, was, I think, really impressive. Just to say, like, I mean, I know of, you know, poetry um, anthologies and all kinds of 
theatrical works and art installations. Um, the uh, now renamed, recently blissfully renamed uh, Utah Tech uh, University, um, Stephen Lee has been doing a yearly exhibit, art exhibition installation for the students at, uh, at, in St. George, Utah, um, that uh, has silhouettes of each of the 43 disappeared students with um, information about all the students, their names, of course, a little bit of their background, which he took from doing um, you know, secondary research into a lot of the, the me excellent Mexican journalism that initially looked into some of the, you know, the stories of who the, all the 43 disappeared students are. Um, you know, there's all kinds of, uh, of amazing exhibitions and artistic expressions. One of the things that most kind of moved me is all of the graphic design stuff that started really early on. You know, the, the parents were marching with these black and white photos that have been taken of their, of their sons, mostly um, for one or another kind of official document, right? So right. these like, you know, black and white photos, we've all taken them, you know, um, and everybody looks like this. Um, and so all these graphic design and artists took those photos and then just basically made them really beautiful in all kinds of ways. And the response of the parents was immediately they started printing those out. They started like getting resources to create these like really nice uh, full color printouts so that they could carry those with them in their marches. They've been carrying them. They also sometimes use the black and white photos, but there was that, that was something that really makes us, you know, it's just, response of you know people in the artistic community seeing something like doing what they do and what they love to do putting it back out because everything is pretty much just shared freely and then the way in which the families themselves took that and and used it and and made it a part of their movement so i mean the families to my knowledge every time they appear in public if they were here right now they hang the photos and the artistic representations of their sons and their loved ones of course, again, not only I used to know, but there are collectives of family members that have, looking for the disappeared, grown up all over the country. They all carry the photographs of their loved ones. You know, of course, it's not only men. I just see that when we talk about sons and, and young men because it's an all-male school. But there are, you know, the mostly women who are leading the families of the disappeared organizations and collectives that are looking across the country. Of course, they're looking for their daughters and they're looking for their granddaughters and they're looking for their... Um, nieces as well as their sons and grandsons. Uh, I would share an, an additional one is Ai Weiwei's uh, Lego mm -hmm. depiction of the disappeared. I was trying to see where it is right now because it used to be in the Museum of Hunan mm -hmm. during the pandemic, but I, I'm not sure where it is anymore. And there's a movie that Ai Weiwei did as mm -hmm. well. So uh, I, I, we have to stop now the streaming part of the conversation and we will continue here in Bolivar House. But thank you to those of you who listened to this. Uh, we have John Bibler uh, telling us about Ajax Napa, eight years of impunity. And uh, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, John. Thank you very much. Okay, if, if it's okay with everyone, I suggest.